So uh, 24B, which is brokerages. So brokerages. So a broker stands between the retail, the customer, the buyer of the security, and usually the exchange. So what he does mainly is to execute. Let's try to do here number one, introduction. So broker usually is uh, associated with buying and selling on customers' behalf. Usually he will be holding the shares on customers' behalf. In other words, he will not usually deliver the shares or stock certificates. So usually he will buy, he will sell, he will what we call execute orders. So he will execute orders. When we say order, we mean a buy order and we mean a sell order. So the first type of uh, type of brokerage is known as full service. Full service brokerage or full service brokerage service. Uh, one of these will be Fidelity. It is associated with providing the full range of services beyond buying and selling, which also includes advising. They will be providing investments, investment analysis. They will be also providing advising. They will be also providing personalized services. Personalized services. And they will be charging a lot of money for it. So they are expensive. Mama. Alright, so the next piece is instead of full service, we call these discount brokerages. And the discount brokerage will simply be executing buy and sell orders. They won't be doing much investment analysis, they won't be doing a lot of advising, there's not going to be anything personalized. All you do is simply buy and sell. When I was in the U.S. from 1997-98, I used E-Trade, which was a classical, classic discount broker. All I wanted them to do is to buy and sell cheaply. So, I was using $7 to buy, $7 to trade, $14, we called it a round trip. I didn't need what we call here uh, what they call here is bells and whistles. In other words, I did not need the extras. I need what we call here core functionality. Core functionality. And core functionality is by sale and Basic accounting. Basic accounting. Hmm? Yeah. All right. So that's the first part. The second part is fairly uh, straightforward, which is uh, types of orders. Types of orders. First of all, the orders go as a buy order, which is an order to buy yeah. a security, Same. and a sell order which is in order to sell. sell a security. And now you have three different, well, there are a lot more than three, but right now we have, have mostly three types of orders. The first order is called a market order, which is to buy or sell market. At, market. Market, at the market price. Yes. But remember, there is no such thing as a market price. There is a market bid and, and a market offer. ask price. Yeah. So if you're going to be buying, you're going to be buying at the ask price. 
and if you're going to be selling, you're going to be selling at, at the bid, bid price. Uh, price. So whatever the bid or whatever they ask is at that time, it will execute at it. And if your order is larger than the size of the offer or the size of the sale, it will execute as many shares at the current, uh, let's say, bid, and then it will execute the next to the next bid, which could be significantly lower. All right? So that's the market. It's fairly straightforward. The next one is B limit. All right. The limit order is execute if it only reaches a certain price. Uh, price. So if you're buying, for example, let's say oil right now is 71 and a half, you may put in a limit at 70. So it will fluctuate up and down and whatnot. And if it touches and reaches 70 and 70 becomes executable, it will execute and it will execute at 70. Now, there are two types of limits. I don't want to get into the details of, uh, you know, if it, if it goes at 70 and can't execute and then goes at 69.50, will it execute or not? So sometimes these are called limit or better. Strictly limit means it must execute at 70 and 70 only. If the price happens to be 69.90, it won't execute. It will just skip through. Mm -hmm. So almost all bro bro modern brokerages, especially for retailers, because retailers don't understand this little legal technicality, will have limit or better. 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 Or better. So 69 to buy is better than 70. So if you put in a limit at 70, it's going to be effectively limit or better. So anything be 70 or below will go through. And the third type, which is actually a special type, it's, is a short selling. For a short selling, what you need is so-called margin, and you need a margin account. account. So short selling is essentially selling shares which you don't have and which you don't own, and usually the broker will identify the shares for you. In other words, he will borrow the shares for, for you and he will loan you the shares which you will short. If you're going to be loaning you the shares, this means that you're going to be effectively borrowing. So a margin account is an account for which you know uh, the owner or, or the account holder can borrow in that account. So you may borrow amount of money or you may borrow shares which is uh, the value equivalent of that amount of money. So short selling the, the will be provided by the broker where the broker will identify another account that have, that owns these shares. They will borrow them from the account for, uh, for you. You will be able to sell short, meaning to sell those shares which you borrowed but don't actually own and that you still owe Rock. and later on when the time comes you will buy back those shares and we call this to cover or to cover a short sometimes known as short covering so to cover a short means to buy back a share on the open market and return it in order to close out a short position. So you open a short position by first selling short and then you close out a short position by covering. In other words, you buy on the market, you take it into your account and then from your, or your account you return those shares to the owner. And in the meantime, if there was any income on the shorted security, if, there were, if you shorted a bond and it was income, for example, the bond paid a dividend, you're liable to pay the dividend to the owner. In other words, you're going to be receiving the dividend, but you're going to pass it on to the genuine owner from which you borrowed. 
And similarly with the stock, if there was a dividend, you still got to pay the, the genuine owner, the one who, owe, who lent you the security, you got to pay back. All right. And oh, within limit orders, there is another special type of a limit order known as stop loss. Well, stop loss uh, can go both for shorting and for long. Uh, I'll explain only for long what is a stop loss. Stop loss, for example, is you uh, buy the security at 70 and then you simply provide a stop loss at 65. This simply means that if the security reaches 65 or less, it will trigger a market order. That's the key. It will trigger a market order to sell at market in order to limit losses. In other words, you bought it at 70, you say, I will tolerate no more than a $5 loss for risk management purposes. Usually traders will use it extensively. And if it goes below 65, you want to sell it, get rid of it. Apparently your trading or investing was not well executed or you didn't put a, a wide enough stop loss or maybe your stop loss is called too tight. So a tight stop loss is a stop loss which is very close to the currently trading market price. That's tight. Usually a stop loss is put immediately as soon as you purchase the security. So you buy the security, let's say it's 72. If oil goes below 65, you put in a stop loss to sell at 65. All right. And let's see, I think this is with brokerages and we have one last piece to cover which is uh, basically risk. Let's see. Oh, finally, let, let's do this final, this final piece. Uh, so orders and, and finally three types. So uh, a brokerage may be buying and selling the most common is they buy and sell stocks. Brokerages may buy and sell bonds. Brokerages may buy and sell commodities. All right, let's see what else. The brokerages may deal also with credit cards. So they may issue a credit card secured with your securities in your portfolio. Or in other words, secured with your account. All right. They may provide other things, all right? So this is pretty much it. And we draw a line here. And you want to finish or what? Yeah. Anna, you want to be done? Uh, no, no, let's continue. All right, so we got one last section. Oh, well, we actually have two. The next section is actually regulation. Mm -hmm. All right, so regulation is usually done by NAST, which is N-A-S-D, National Association of Security Dealers. Regulation is done by the, also the exchanges. By law, each exchange requires to regulate its trading. It has members. It is required to regulate its members. And each exchange must provide certain minimum regulatory requirements. In other words, the law says each exchange must regulate on this, 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 and this. And then on top of that, the, the exchange will regulate on a whole bunch of other things that it deems appropriate. All right? So they will impose required minimum by law and then extra whatever they might find appropriate as different type. Commodity markets will have one type of, you know, of specifics. Stocks will have different with shorting. Bonds will have a third one. All right. So let's see. Uh-oh. Okay. <clears throat>
All right, so uh, so this is the, the, the exchanges. All right, disclosure rule, regulations and whatnot. Interestingly enough, the Federal Reserve Central Bank will be a regulator, especially when it comes to margins. So, margins associated with borrowing and lending, and they fall within the regulatory power of the central bank. Today, the central bank requires 50% margin for stock accounts. So, they regulate that. Back in the old days, when they had the real estate bubble, and everyone was speculating on margin, a lot of people pretty much said that uh, the Fed must raise margin requirements for long so that they can't buy on margin in order to tame speculation. And the Fed did not want to stop the party. The party was just getting going good in 97, especially 98, especially 99. And the Fed refused to tame speculation which resulted in a wild bubble, the Nasdaq.com telecom bubble, and then in a major stock market uh, bust. There is also a concept which is known as uh, SIPC. So, SIPC, and this is very similar to FDIC. SIPC is the securities, what is, how they call it? Investor Protection. Protection Corporation, which secures or ensures that if a broker goes bankrupt and you have your money with the broker, meaning your securities, you will not lose your investments. Uh, usually it uh, uh, secures, and this is extremely important also against fraud. So if the broker takes the money, and goes back to Switzerland or whichever islands they go, usually SIPC will pay. And the idea here is to, the same, remember as in commercial banks with FDIC, to boost confidence. It is all about confidence in the financial system. Everything is about confidence. Somehow, there is this belief that no matter how bad the financial system operates, no matter how corrupt it is, no matter how terrible things are, if people have confidence, everything will be fine and everything will be okay. This is exactly the way it is presented in Bulgaria. If we just have confidence in Bulgarian currency, the currency board will never collapse. If we just have a confidence in the commercial banks, commercial banks will never go bankrupt. As if the only thing which is necessary for the survival and proper functioning of the financial system is Conf confidence. And the answer is, it is a component for those institutions which operate under fractional reserve banking and are inherently bankrupt. It is necessary for survival, yeah. but it is not sufficient. People believe that it's sufficient. If we just have confidence, no matter how terrible they are, everything will be fine. Well, the answer is no, they won't be fine. All right, and the last section is risks. All right, so the first type of risk is a market risk. You studied portfolio theory. Risk. Yeah, or also systematic risk, but in this case, it's more of a market risk. Uh, investment banks and brokerages profit tremendously during bull markets. During bull markets, there is a lot of activity, there is a lot of speculation going on, there is a lot of transaction that occur, lots of buying, lots of selling, and in market booms, the investment banking and the brokerage industries also boom. Also, if they have certain securities that they keep on their inventories, uh, rising markets will 
appreciate their securities. All right? All right, so uh, in other words, whatever equity and bond positions they have, they will rise. Also, in market booms, you have a booming IPO market, which is a godsend for investment banking profits. All right, so that's second. Third, in booming markets, you also get a lot of takeovers and targets and MBOs, LBOs and MBOs and everything else. So, booming market is also great for the restructuring uh, business and all of those things. It is also great for the arbitrage business too. In other words, when the market goes bust, these businesses, their activity can fall down easily three, five, or ten times. All right. So the overall performance and the overall profitability of the firms is entirely dependent on the performance of the market and therefore correlates to market risk. The next one is interest rate risks. Here the performance is inversely related to interest rates. Rates Falling interest rates are good for investment banks as they profit from those, usually results in a booming bond market, usually is associated with the booming stock market. So lower interest rates are good for them and falling or sorry, rising interest rates are usually bad for them. Usually they take very, very short term bets like the bridge loans that we discussed before or some other short term financing. So usually don't, they don't have a significant exposure to the classic type of interest rate risk where you borrow short and lend long or you have a, a mismatch between the duration of assets and the duration of liability. So you don't have a duration gap in a classic form of interest rate exposure, so they don't suffer from this type of interest rate risk. But the performance is dependent on the movements of interest rates because their overall business activity, the volume of activity, is related to the trends, to the long-term trends in interest rates. All right? And another one is credit risk. Let's see what we have. It's mostly what I mentioned is those bridge loans. In other words, they don't loan a lot of money. So they have relatively little credit risk. The main credit risk that they expose themselves is the bridge loan. And the bridge loan means that they may have misjudged the risk about that particular junk bond. They may have thought that they are covered effectively and the market's reaction may be very different or the market itself, whether by interest rate or the market itself, may change from the time of the bridge loan till the time that the loan is getting repaid. And they also have or occasionally assume if they're international exchange rate risk, which I'm not at least covering in this course, usually is in international financial management or international finance. And that's pretty much it. If you want to say hello to the company, oh, bye to the camera, and we're done with this course. Yeah. No, I'm going you're, you can turn around or, or you can all walk out. <laughs> Alright, so say you say, do you like the course and how it was? And the best course ever. The best course ever. Number one. Okay. okay. Number you can one. your camera, just walk out and you don't have to do that. So. Alright. So, right. so, so we're done? Everybody? Okay. Well, thank you for the course. Through 